Make him rage quit, exit out the door. Yeah. Use his favorite team with a Baltimore. Huh? Don't get mad. Huh? It's just what it is. Yeah, we talking sports shot out the engraving bins. Yeah. The YouTube team keep it clean. What's going on? It's Engraven here with another video and another episode of NFL questions from subscribers, which is a series where you can ask me anything about the NFL or any player. And we answered in a video just like this. If you'd like to be part of NFL questions from subscribers, you can send me an email to team keep it clean at gmail.com or for the patrons, you can send it to me directly on Patreon. And if any one of y'all would like to become a patron, then you can go to patreon.com slash engraven vids. Uh, team Keep It Clean, I love y'all. I appreciate y'all. We have a special guest on this episode of NFL Questions from Subscribers. Uh, it is my guy, Kevin Redline. And you know what? Let's let him introduce himself to all of you. Team Keep It Clean, on this episode of NFL Questions from Subscribers, we joined by my boy, Kevin Redline. Kevin, go ahead and introduce everybody to yourself. What's going on, y'all? It's Kevin Redline. Uh... I just joined, you know, started the new YouTube thing. Uh, I used to just do Ravens edits, but I recently started talking about some of the, the news that comes out about the Ravens, and pretty much you can find me on YouTube, Kevin underscore Redline. All right. And what, what made you want to start, like, talking about Ravens? Because like you said, I know you used to do them fire edits and the Ravens, like that, that, that little Marvel uh, intro, but Ravens style. Yeah. What made you go from doing the edits or the highlights and stuff to actually jumping into like sort of commentary about the Ravens? Um, so it was a couple of things. Like one thing I used to notice is that, you know, I would tune into your videos and your lives and I would chat with you. And uh, the biggest driving force was after that, after that loss to the Steelers, I just was like, you know, I got to talk about this, man. Um, and I just Which recorded one? a video. Uh, the first one, the first oh. loss to the Steelers last year. Mm -hmm. um, and I just recorded a video and I just posted it. I didn't edit it. I didn't do anything. I literally just recorded it, posted it. I mean, it got like a couple of views, but I was just like, you know, it was nice to just kind of express how I feel about certain things because, right. you know, everybody has a different opinion. Mm -hmm. And uh, the couple of comments that did come in, they brought up some good points and um, I, it, it was just a way for me to express my anger and, you know, sometimes celebrate, yeah. uh, because sometimes you got to get it out. And another thing, my boy, Travis, he, he wasn't available to kind of express that frustration as well. So it was just a nice way to, for, for me to express how I feel. And it turned out like a lot of people felt the same way I felt. So it was just... Uh, a nice turn and it was a nice way to, for me to you know continue to pump out content as well yeah i i like that because um that's one of my favorite parts about youtube because we we have the espn's the nfl networks the fs1s the, the whatever other sports stations there are and they can sort of uh what they do a lot of times on there they can try to sort of select your opinion they can try to make make your opinion what they want it to be based off of the select information they share with you uh, on whatever given team, whatever given player or whatnot. Now, sometimes it is accurate information. Other times it's not. Sometimes it's sort of stretched to fit a certain narrative and whatnot. Um, but that's one of the things that I appreciate about YouTube that like we can say our thing. We can say how we feel about whatever it is, whatever it might be. And it's our opinion based off of how we feel. And, and people that have been like really rocking with the team for years and really understand a lot of the ins and outs of the team. We don't know everything, but we know a lot about the team, know a lot about their patterns and whatnot. And for the uh, the experts and the analysts and whatnot, I know it can be very hard uh, for them to sort of give accurate judgments on different things with the team and different aspects of the team because they cover all 32 teams in, in detail. So when, when you cover when you look you're a jack of all trades but you're a master of none, then it, it shows. And then with so many people, they um they they look to the people in the media and like, okay, since they're on TV, then it's right. Since they're since they're on TV, then all this information is accurate. And a lot of times that's that's not even the case. Yep. And um I mean honestly, that's how I got onto your channel. I was actually in Florida. It was oh. uh <laughs> <laughs> I was in Florida, and it was the uh, Lamar's rookie year. 
Mm-hmm. And again, like I, I really didn't know much about Lamar. Right. And on the drive to Orlando, we, uh, me and my boy Trash, stumbled across your your uh, your channel, oh. and I was like, "Man, this guy has some real funny takes, but they're true." <laughs> like I was just like, he he's making a lot of good points. He, you talked about a couple of things that, you know, I felt, but you really don't hear, especially back then, because we didn't get much coverage at all right. back then. So, and it was nice to get content or hear about the Ravens uh, and and not just be a, a quick thing like, oh, the Ravens did this. And then yeah. they eventually move on to the Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, Link. A Cowboy, yeah, yeah, they get covered all year. No matter what's going on, slow season, fast season, they're gonna talk about some cowboys. So right. yeah, that that that's a real good point. Um, what uh, so what 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 are your goals for your channel? What what are you looking to do? What are you looking to accomplish? Or is it just a step by step, day by day sort of thing? It's honestly a step by step, day by day thing. Uh, I'm not trying to like have it be my career, but I I do want to use that platform to kind of talk about things that I don't hear from, you know, other YouTubers or or in the media and a way for me to express, you know, myself as a Ravens fan. Um, You know, if it takes off, it takes off. But if it doesn't, I'll still post my thoughts and everything. Um, So, yeah, I I pretty much take it day by day. Good. Cool, man. Man, Again, appreciate you hopping on, especially – short notice i know we've been trying to get this thing together for a little minute but we finally both got the time so we got some fire questions like we always do so let's go ahead and get into it all right first question came from my boy deandre he said with wink talking about hayes and away being players for them this year do you think that puts an end to the justin houston talks if so do you think the costa goes all in on the offensive side of the ball and trades for julio jones on june 1st Keep up the good work, love the videos, and hashtag Ravens flop. So um, with the Julio Jones thing, I th- I don't think um, if they did trade for Julio Jones, it'd be cool or whatnot. Me, I I don't expect them to. I can give you a million reasons why I think they should, uh, but I, I don't expect them to. But I, I hope they do. Um, by the time y'all see this video, he'll probably have been traded to wherever he's going to go. Um, but for for the first question, do you think uh, with Wink, the way that he's talking about Dalen Hayes and Adafi away, does that put the end, the end to the Justin Houston talks? In my opinion, I don't think so. I don't think it does because I think this could be Wink's and the Ravens' way of trying to maybe entice Justin Houston that much more and sort of drive his uh, bargain down, I mean drive his market down all at the same time, uh, well, their market for him because when you talk up who you have already, uh, that makes who's not there let seem less valuable to you or, or seem less valuable to them. And they could be like, oh, man, well, maybe Ravens don't want me. And that could either make them turn away or make them want to come that much more with that rejection. Well, that that that's that's subtle rejection. Um, but I, I don't think it's the end of Justin Houston to the Ravens, or I don't think it's the end of really any pass rusher to the Ravens. I do still think they're going to end up signing a veteran. What about you? Um, I'm with you. Uh I agree with what you said. And one of the things that I, you know, I feel is that the Ravens look at it as a win-win because they know that they draft well, you know, it's on the defensive side of the ball. So Mm -hmm. for them, these young guys are athletic as, you know, as long as they stay healthy, they, they, they feel like they're going to produce. And, um, you know, as long as the veterans are up front, I feel like they think, hey, we can go younger on the back on a, uh, as far as the linebackers. So they they're like, hey, if we get Justin Houston, it, it's it, it's great. If we don't, we'll be fine. Yeah, that's just, like just the way that the team is built. It, it's not a it's not a big need for Justin Houston. Yeah. That's just you know my opinion on it. Just the just the way they act. They like worst case he doesn't go as low as for as far as price he doesn't go as as far as they want him to go but he's still signable the next question came from my boy trey five he said what's up engraving hope all is well with you and the fam i want to know your thoughts on eric DeCosta's draft classes every year i find myself saying that this is a good draft class but 
ADC has yet to draft a pro bowler. Ozzy drafted at least one in 2016, 2017, and 2018 before he stepped down as GM, and they became pro bowlers quickly. EDC just finished his third draft, and yet no pro bowlers. I love EDC, but I think that sometimes Ravens fans look at his draft classes with rose-colored glasses. I mean, take a look at the 2019 class. Now, um, I do not think that pro bowls is – a great way to judge if a class was successful or not. I mean, obviously, if, if it's a bunch of Pro Bowlers in a class, then, yeah, they did pretty good because, I mean, they were recognized by the NFL and by players and fans and whatnot. But the Pro Bowl is not the end-all, be-all. The Pro Bowl is not the cutoff for, okay, if a player made the Pro Bowl, he's great. But if a player didn't make the Pro Bowl, Pro Bowl then he's a, he's a bum. He's sorry. I don't think that that's the um, that's the that's uh, the, where the pedestal should be at. Uh, but when you speak about the 2019 class, yeah, it's Hollywood. Uh, so he definitely – I think when you got when you look at the draft classes, you got to look at the impact that they had on the team uh, since they've been there. Now, last year, I, I give Eric DaCosta and them, I give him a pass because of the whole C-19, the whole pandemic. That, like, changed everything with the rookie class. But a lot of those guys still had a significant impact. Um, but you brought up 2019 as Hollywood – uh, he's obviously had a big impact. Uh, Miles Boykin has had an impact, not a huge impact. Um, and that's really it because they also drafted Jalen Ferguson, Justice Hill, Ben Powers, Eamon Marshall, Dalen Mack. He's not even on the team anymore. And Trace McSorley. Trace McSorley, he gets a pass because he's a backup quarterback. But it, it really, that wasn't a real impactful draft. Uh, and I, I mean, I've seen a lot of people who, yeah, with Eric DaCosta, um, as far as the, the draft, it definitely could use, uh, some improvement when it comes to impact players. Um, but you look at l last year's draft, uh, it certainly has some impact players in there because, uh, they got a Patrick Queen, they got a J.K. Dobbins. And both of those two certainly made their mark. And even Justin Matabike, he came on a lot stronger toward the end of the year, but he's somebody that let it be known who he was. And then even though it wasn't the best rookie season from him, Tyree Phillips too. Tyree Phillips who played at right tackle, he played at right guard, they moved him around and whatnot. Uh, and he struggled a bit here and there, but he had a, he had a pretty big impact uh, on the season. And they he was a starter for uh, – a Big part of the season. Um, so with, with the draft last year, I think it was a good one. And the thing about the, the draft last year, uh, especially with a lot of the top guys, is that they, um, they had a significant impact on the team despite having that lack of an offseason. But as far as Eric DaCosta, how are you feeling about Eric DaCosta uh, as GM when it comes to his drafts? Uh, as far as Eric DaCosta drafting, it's like, you can see what he's taking from Ozzy, but mm. he doesn't take the things that that kind of hurt Ozzy's, you know, draft history, especially on the offensive side of the ball. Mm. So what I mean by that is kind of like he doesn't he doesn't fall in love with a specific kind of player because uh, who 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 was uh who was it that Ozzy used to what what college did Ozzy Oh, what was it? Alabama. Alabama all day. Alabama. So yeah, yeah, he doesn't get tied to a school. It's like, okay, <laughs> <laughs> he he sees a certain kind of player and he's like, I like him, but we're gonna have a backup. Like EDC doesn't fall in love. And I appreciate that. And as <laughs> far as like, you know, the whole Pro Bowl thing, I don't really like you, I don't pay attention to that because the Pro Pro Bowl can really be a, a popularity contest if you think mm -hmm. about it. Right. Um and being that you have people that had you know had an impact on the team, like like you mentioned, Patrick Queen, uh, Tyree Phillips, um, J.K., those names can get lost just with uh, Lamar Jackson alone. Man. He gets a lot of the shine, so it it can be hard to recognize the impact that players have. Mm -hmm. Like that that's why that whole Pro Bowl thing. I don't really get caught up in this, into that because, you know, that's one of those things that they bring up on on mainstream, and I'm like, I, I don't, I don't really care about that because 
it doesn't really tell the whole story about who was drafted or, you know, the impact that they had on the team. Next question came from my guy, Corey. He said, Aang Graven, despite some other fans, I'm very happy with the draft. However, I must say I'm still not happy about the wide receivers we have all together. Let me explain. We've done good in the draft, got two new coaches for receivers. Hopefully these wide receiver coaches are creative and they get g Rose respect, so he willingly listens to them and often. But I really want a Julio Jones or at least a good big body proven 50-50 veteran. These rookies are good, but is the possibility of a Larry Fitzgerald out of the question if it's money? They went for Dez for years. Larry Fitzgerald is still a free agent. Golden Tate wouldn't be bad either. Oh, yuck. Think about it. Um, well, before I get into that second paragraph, uh, check for Julio Jones. I'll be down for that. Uh, Golden Tate, no, no, thank you. Um, and with Larry Fitzgerald, he's like, nobody knows if he's going to retire or not. And if they were to get a Larry Fitzgerald, I would be scared. The reason I would be scared, uh, we know the pluses with Larry Fitzgerald. He's obviously one of the most respected, not even just receivers, but players in the league. Um, consistent guy. Uh, has he fallen off? Yes, but his hands, they ain't going nowhere. So he could definitely uh, help the Ravens in that aspect. Um, could help be sort of a mentor, even though that wouldn't be his job, but I'm sure he would be willing to do it, to be a mentor to the young Ravens receivers, and like all of them are young, so that would be nice. Uh, but with Larry Fitzgerald, with him uh, possibly being on the verge of retirement, it's not set in stone, but he ain't go back to the Cardinals. So, I mean, it's looking like it. Could it be a thing where if the Ravens signed him, they signed him and he went through training camp and all that, and then at training camp he was like, you know what? I don't feel like doing this another year. I'm done. I just – I just – no. I don't think Larry Fitz would be the way to go. Um, he would be a reliable guy now. Again, them hands, him, he would catch everything. Uh, it's crazy that this dude got more more tackles than drop passes. That's that doesn't even make any <laughs> sense. Yeah. But I uh, I would probably lean on the side of uh, of no for this one. What about you when it comes to Julio or Larry Fitz and Golden Tate? <laughs> yeah, I'm with you. Golden Tate. Yeah, I, I'm good. Uh, Larry, actually, I wouldn't mind if they didn't get any of them. Uh, but I wouldn't be mad if they got Julio or Larry Fitz. And I know with Larry Fitz, it's like, is he going to retire or not? Or would he give us that one year, one last year? Uh -huh. But um, me, I, I'm I'm good because, like, the Ravens are an unorthodox team. Like, they, they operate differently. And um, we don't – I don't – I still don't feel like we need to have that A1 receiver. We just need a group of guys that can get the job done. Mm. Um, and like I said in, in one of my older videos, it's like we didn't even really use the guys that we had. Um, yeah. It was Andrews, Hollywood, and if they failed, it was uh, Sneed. But we didn't, like last year, we didn't see DuVernay. We didn't see Prochet. Um, Miles would come through one or two plays, but then he wouldn't get any looks after that. Yeah. It, it's, it, to me, it's a matter of using who we have, because even if we brought somebody in, it may be a, a situation in which we're forcing them the ball. It's like, okay, this play is drawn up for uh, Julio. Or this play is drawn up for Larry Fitz. And then, you know, the Ravens can become real predictable when they have those kind of options. <laughs> uh, so I, I'd rather have, you know, continue to develop the guys we have. Let's see what these young guys can do. Because I, I think that they can be an immediate impact. It, it's no coincidence that the Steelers can – always bringing guys as far as wide receivers that make an immediate impact but the Ravens seem to struggle that, that that always seems like it's a thing so I'm I'm fine without Julio and uh, Larry Fitz but it's not like I'm gonna be disappointed if they do get one of them because we will continue to build up the talent at the uh, wide receiver spot and and I'll say this real quick 
Uh-huh. One thing about the Ravens, like this year, that's different from any other year. As far as tight end and wide receiver, they have plenty of talent to evaluate. <laughs> yes. So it's not like they just they they're forced to just go with what they got with what they have. Uh, they they can sit back and evaluate it like you know what this guy is looking really good you know we need to make him you know you know put him on the team rather than be stuck in a situation where we we have to go with this guy the yeah. leftovers you know yeah they they do have a, a right now on the roster they got a lot of wide receivers and a lot of tight ends so yeah it's it's really gonna be one of those things to where uh may the best men win. Um, and you could start seeing guys get shipped off, get traded off to the different teams, guys who they just, they know right now, um, they don't have any plans for moving forward. Next question came from Tanja. Uh, she said, hey, Graven, what's up? How are you and the family? Are oh, we doing good. Uh, I just saw a film on Huddle Up Films, and it showed the Colts and Steelers game. Shout out to my guy, Huddle Up Films. Uh, she said, focusing on Justin Houston getting burnt the whole game. Most Ravens fans are high on Justin Houston. Is it because there aren't many edge rushers left? I believe we need a veteran edge rusher, but is he it? Um, so starting off there, because she has some more questions too. How do you feel about Justin Houston? You think he is the guy? He is a great option for the Ravens? Or do you feel like Ravens fans just interested in Justin Houston because he's the best available pass rusher? I think it's a bit of both. Um yeah. You know, when when guys come to the Ravens, they it's a di- like I said, we're unorthodox. So the way we would utilize them, most likely with Wink, he's not going to put him in a position to get burned. You know what I mean? Like Wink is pretty good about that. Um, and if he does, we got the quick young guys in the back to back him up. So um, with that being said, I think. The, the name alone, Justin Houston, just draws people in and they like, we need to get him, we need to get him when <laughs> it's not necessarily the truth, you know? Okay. All right. And the next part of the question, she said, we also picked up uh, Villain the Waiver to play out his natural position until Ronnie Stanley comes back. More gambling on the offensive line. Uh, there were quality centers and guards in the draft that were still available after we chose our picks. Instead, they picked a lot of maybes. Why wouldn't they do like other teams and pick proven players that are talented in their specific skill sets? Not trying to be a Debbie Downer, but if Lamar's line is like last year, this will be another epic fail. I do hope it all comes together, though. What are your thoughts? So with the offensive line, she said they picked a lot of maybes. Now, um, I would disagree when it comes to Ben Cleveland. I think Ben Cleveland, in his collegiate career, and the, the entirety of it, he gave up like three sacks. And to play the amount of games and be a starter too, and only give up three sacks, like some people give that up in a season. Some people even can give that up in a span of six games. Some people can give that up in one game. Mm-hmm. Um, so, But for him to give that up in total in three years, I don't think that he would be considered a, a maybe player uh, on the offensive line. Um, now we do hope, like you said, hope it all comes together with the offensive line, because if it's anything like last year, then the Ravens, they'll be able to get by, but they won't be able to go far. They really won't, uh, especially in the playoffs. Like they can, you can squeak by with a bad offensive line in a regular season, but come playoffs, nah, that, that ain't going to fly. Um, because we saw that last year. Uh, but with, with the Ravens, I, I don't, yeah, I don't feel like they picked a lot of maybes on the offensive line. Uh, well, Alejandro uh, Villanueva, he, I don't even think he's a maybe because he he played in this type of offense. Like he said at his introductory presser, this was the type of offense that he played in when he was at college. So like you said, he is going back to his natural position and he will be able to be a, uh, a just in case option uh, if Ronnie Stanley isn't 100% by the start of the season. Uh, and Ravens, they have, even if they don't go, well, I, I was about to say if they don't go young, but the offensive line is pretty young. But it, even if worst case scenario, Ronnie Stanley isn't ready, you you could throw Villain the wave over there, and then he'll he'll have had. I know a lot of people don't like it, but he'll have had a full off season, so you could throw Tyree Phillips at right tackle. But 
Ravens, I think their offensive line, as long as they're healthy, they got no choice but to be better than last year. What about you? Uh, yeah, I, I disagree. Like, I don't think they're just maybes. Because um, what we, we got is Zeitler from the Giants. Oh, yeah, I forgot about him. Um, Villanueva, Ben Cleveland. Ben Cleveland is the only offensive lineman the Ravens have drafted that I actually just got excited. I got excited once I <laughs> looked into who he was. I was like, man, he looked like the juggernaut. Like once he once he gets moving forward, you, it, it doesn't look like anybody can push him back. So if you look across across the board, the Ravens' offensive line is solid. Um, even with Tyree Phillips. You know he's going. He he he's had a full year, and now he'll have this off season. It's mm -hmm. going to be more normal than what it was. Because right. if you look at the the line last year, um, even before Stanley got hurt, uh, we 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 who 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 got hurt? Uh, Skura, Skura came back, but he came back off of that terrible injury. Yeah, and we didn't really have a normal off season. We didn't have a preseason. He had no time to really get adjusted to what it, you know, getting back into football shape. Right. It kind of had to happen throughout the year, and it didn't quite happen that way. Mm -hmm. um, then Stanley got hurt, uh, and we were just shifting guys around. Mm -hmm. They literally were trying to figure out the center position. So now, I mean, I guess you can say the biggest maybe because they put Bozeman at uh, center, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so obviously they feel comfortable about him being there. And to me, it's a way more solid line to support him. So even if it is a weakness in the center, the rest of the line is taken care of. And he, even if the running back needs to provide some help in pass situations, that's still, you know, that's still an option. So, I mean, I don't think it's a bunch of maybes. I say if, if there's any maybe, it, it would be Bozeman, but... Uh, I think it's a pretty solid O-line. All right, next question came from my boy, King Franks. He said, I think if the Ravens' passing attack can go to 19 or 20, the Ravens can be Super Bowl champions and Lamar can be the MVP. What are your thoughts? Mm. Going from uh, 32nd to rank 19th or 20th, while it's not impossible, I, I don't see that happening. And I don't even think... Like I've been saying all offseason, I don't even think they would have to make a significant jump like that in order to be Super Bowl contenders or even Super Bowl champs. Um, they just need better efficiency. Uh, they just need to drop a lot less passes, catch a lot more. And the, the concepts, the concepts definitely need to improve. There needs to be variety because uh, when it comes playoffs, like my guy Josh Hoffman, he said it best uh, with the volume. The volume of uh, passing plays and the volume of passing concepts, sometimes uh, that little amount of passing yards, that can be an indicator that maybe the Ravens, they don't really have that many uh, passing plays drawn up like that. And they don't have that much creativity with it. So they can get by during a regular season, but in the playoffs, if they have to pass, teams will be like, oh, no, we, we know what's coming. We know what's on the way. Um, so I just – that that would be a very significant jump. Uh, I wouldn't be mad at that at all if they jumped from 32nd to 19th to 20th. Um, and I, I think if they were doing that, then, oh, boy. I just wonder how it would impact the run game. Uh, but I would, be, I would be willing to sacrifice the number one run game for that to be dropped to maybe like four, five, even six if they, they're passing jump that high because that's a significant jump. But then now that I think about it too, it just it just all depends because numbers don't tell the whole story because there are plenty of teams out there who had much more passing yards than the Ravens, but then you look at their record and it was like, oh, like what were all those passing yards good for? Because a lot of those passing yards can be trying to come back if you're down big or something, you just pass the ball. Um, so it all just depends on the situation. But if the Ravens are still winning and they had like 19th, 20th, okay. I'm cool with it. How about you? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't see that happening. Like I said the Ravens, <laughs> the Ravens, they, they're unorthodox. Like they, they don't, they don't function or operate like all the other teams out there. So, um, I would like to see Lamar's rushing yards 
either converted to passing yards or uh, rushing yards from the running backs. Because, mm. uh, you know, that playoff game against the, against the Bills, even before he got, you know, especially before he got hurt, he looked tired. That was the mm. first time I, I noticed him looking tired. Um, but I think they will move up. And, and, and like you say, it doesn't tell the whole story. Um, how many calls was called back because of, uh, what, what is it, uh, uh, ineligible man downfield, uh, <laughs> holding, yeah. um, people dropping the ball? The, didn't uh, Simply AS10 put up a 10-minute video? Granted, some of it was replayed, but still, it was a lot of drop passes. Mm-hmm. And had, let's say, you know, 75% of those passes that were dropped weren't dropped, we might be a few spots lower. We, you know, yeah. we, we might, we, oh, we might have, yeah, been in a better position. We might have beat the Bills. Like, things things will be different. Um, we really opened up our passing game with our dominant run game. Um, it was just this past year, we, did, we didn't catch protect, uh, particularly well. So, um, I think we will move up maybe a spot or two. And that's all that the Ravens really need to be successful because we're not other teams. And like you mentioned, um, teams that had crazy passing stats, what, wasn't Atlanta one of them? Uh, they used to, uh... Yeah, they didn't win too many games. <laughs> Cowboys, uh, Dak was about to break, you know, he was breaking records. Mm-hmm. Um, but they weren't particularly winning games. Um, that's always the case. And that's, you know, sorry to move to a different subject, kind of, but, like, L.A. was the number one team as far as uh, accumulating QB sacks, right? I, I think, I, I believe so. I was looking into that. But yet they allowed, like, the most points or something like that. So, yeah, they were sacking the QB, but they were also allowing a bunch of points. That's why I said the whole people getting frustrated about Jason away, I mean, excuse me, Adafi away, mm-hmm. not – Getting any sacks last year is not necessary for the Ravens to be successful. But yeah, I, to answer that question, I think they'll move up a couple of spots because I think that is a focal point. Uh, that's why they brought in T. Martin and what, what's the other guy's name? Yeah, Keith Williams. Um, Keith Williams. And um, I was watching The Wired, and he was he was uh, working with Bateman, and he showed him you know how to you know do a comeback or whatever. And I said, man. I didn't see David Cully in no Wired episode do that once. I said, so this guy has already impressed me uh, and make me feel like these wide receivers are going to, uh, you know, elevate and be successful on the team. Man. Especially, didn't Hollywood just come out and say, like, they're amazing or something like that? Didn't he tweet that? Or when they asked him about them in the uh, press conference, I think he commented and said, they're amazing. Oh yeah, he he said they um they they do everything to get the most uh out of all the wide receivers, and I I know um he said too a while back that he uh he's familiar with one of them already. I, I'm not sure if it was Keith Williams or T. Martin, but he's familiar with one of the two, uh. So that should help. Uh, that should help him moving forward too, with just being comfortable uh with them as coaches. <laughs>